Lecture 26, Life in the Greenhouse. In the previous lecture, I introduced a number of ideas relating to heat, the flow of heat, uh, temperature scales, how we measure temperature, and so forth. In this lecture, I'd like to apply those ideas to planet Earth. And the particularly important idea I'd like to apply is the idea of energy balance that I introduced at the end of the previous lecture. And in that idea, I described in particular a greenhouse, a greenhouse that was heated by the sun, that warmed up, that achieved an internal temperature that was higher than the outdoor temperature, and it did so by achieving a balance between the energy coming in by sunlight and the energy that was lost, in that case largely by conduction through the walls of the greenhouse to the outside. That process of energy balance ultimately determines the temperature of any object or system that is subject to an influx of energy and then loses energy by any of the three energy transfer methods we talked about last time, conduction, that is flow of heat through a material medium, convection, the transfer of energy by the motions of a warmed fluid, or radiation, the loss of energy by electromagnetic waves. Of those three, only radiation can take place in the absence of matter. So a system like a planet, like planet Earth, ultimately can lose energy to space only by radiation. So things get a little simpler. We only have to worry about one transfer mechanism when we're talking about the overall energy balance of planet Earth. We've got to be a little bit more careful than that, though, because intermediately between the Earth and the atmosphere, between different levels of the atmosphere, other energy transfer mechanisms, particularly convection and the, motion of, of heat, the motions of heated air, may play a significant role. Now, what I'm going to give you in this lecture is ultimately just a brief introduction to the science of climate and climate change. It's what could become a whole course in itself, but we're just going to look for a brief interval at some of the key scientific ideas. Now, I'm well aware that climate change is a subject that is sometimes seems to be fraught with controversy. And I'm going to stick strictly to the science here. I'm not going to talk about consequences of climate change. I'm not going to talk about much about the future of climate change that we expect to have happen on Earth, although I will mention briefly some aspects of that. But I do want to say one thing at the outset in, in the, in the uh, spirit of this particularly scientific discussion of climate change, um, and that is that some of the controversy that you may have heard surrounding climate change uh, is really not much of a controversy when it comes down to the scientific community. Um, much of climate science is absolutely solidly established, and people of all shades of political persuasion are in agreement about many, many, many of the aspects of climate change. And the vast majority of climate scientists are in agreement, in fact, that climate change is now occurring and that it's something that we human beings are at least partly responsible for. And I'm not going to go any further into that, but I want to dispel the notion that there is still a very broad controversy about climate change. We've come to know a great deal about Earth's climate, and particularly in the last few decades, we've come to know a lot and to firm up our understanding of climate change. And again, I'm going to dwell in this lecture only on the scientific basis of climate change, to give you an understanding of what determines Earth's climate, what determines the temperature of our planet, and what might be happening to change that temperature, either naturally or because of things we human beings do. Now, one thing we have to understand about the Earth that greatly simplifies the question of establishing its climate, unlike some systems, Earth has almost exclusively a single source of energy, and that source of energy is the sun. Sunlight provides about 99.98% of all the energy coming to the surface of planet Earth. Um, most of the rest comes from the interior of the Earth. Uh, it comes from the primordial heat that is still left over from when the planet formed four and a half billion years ago. Some of it also comes from the decay of naturally occurring radioactive elements. So a tiny fraction of the energy coming to the surface of the Earth comes from inside the planet. And there are a few places like Yellowstone National Park, uh, the Geysers Power Plant in California, where, or the island of Hawaii, where that heat is significant is a significant player in the, in the uh, energy flows in that region. But by and large, that's not a significant player in the energy flow to planet Earth. 99.98% of the energy coming to planet Earth comes from uh, the sun. Uh, in addition to the energy from the interior, there's a very small amount of energy coming from the uh, tides as they dissipate their energy crashing against the land shores or simply through fluid friction in the water. And that energy ultimately derives itself from the rotation of the Earth and the revolution of the moon around the Earth. But that's almost insignificant with the exception of a few places where we humans have harnessed tidal power to generate electricity. So the easy thing to remember about planet Earth is it gets almost all its energy from one source, namely the sun. And here we have to think about another aspect of what I introduced last time, particularly radiation. 
I showed you, I had a 200 watt light bulb here and a variable auto transformer that I could use to set the amount of electric current through the light bulb. And we saw two things. We saw the hotter the bulb was, the more total energy it radiated. But we saw something else. We saw the hotter I made the bulb, the whiter the color of the light. At first it glowed a very dull red. Actually it was grow glowing mostly in the infrared. We couldn't see a little bit in the red. And then it glowed orange and then yellow and eventually glowed kind of white hot. So there is a difference in the wavelength, the color of the radiation emitted by objects depending on what their temperature is. The sun emits light that is, appears to us white and is peaked in roughly the uh, yellow-green area of the spectrum. Uh, that's because the sun's surface temperature is about 6,000 kelvins or roughly 6,000 degrees Celsius. We could convert that to Fahrenheit if we wanted, but I won't bother. So the sun is pretty hot and that determines the color of the light it emits. The Earth, on the other hand, is a very relatively cool object. The surface temperature of the Earth is, in rough round numbers, 300 kelvins, about a twentieth the surface temperature of the Sun. And that means the kind of radiation that the warm Earth emits is a very different kind. It's all electromagnetic radiation, but it's a very different wavelength of electromagnetic radiation than what the Sun emits. The Earth emits infrared, not infrared that's even very near the color red, but infrared that's uh, much longer in wavelength and uh, much lower in frequency. And that's important to understanding climate. Sunlight comes from the sun. It's a very short wavelength radiation. It's mostly in the form of visible light. The Earth, in turn, radiates long wavelength radiation, infrared radiation. Sure, it's electromagnetic waves in both cases. It travels at speed C through vacuum. It consists of crossed electric and magnetic fields, as I showed you in a previous lecture in model th Module 3. But it may interact very differently with matter. And that's the key to understanding Earth's climate. So let's take a look at what Earth's energy balance looks like. So here's Earth sitting in the middle of space. And again, because it's surrounded by the vacuum of space, the only way Earth can exchange energy with its surroundings to any significant extent is by radiation. And here comes radiation in from the sun. Incoming sunlight hits Earth. Basically, it's always hitting just one side of Earth as the planet rotates. That's why we have night and day. And the Earth warms up. If the Earth were not warm, if the Earth were ice cold at the time we turned on the sun, this is a silly experiment to think of, but it helps you get a sense of how the Earth gets to its temperature. If the Earth were extremely cold, zero kelvins, absolute zero, sunlight would come in, it would supply energy to the planet, the planet would warm up, the planet would begin to radiate a little bit of, elect of electromagnetic radiation at very long wavelengths because of its low temperature. It would heat up and emit more electromagnetic radiation, and eventually it would heat up to the point where it was emitting as much energy as it was getting from the sun. And then, like the greenhouse of the last uh, lecture, it would be an energy balance, and it would be at a constant fixed temperature. And we can calculate that temperature very easily, because we know the law that describes how hot objects or warm objects emit electromagnetic radi radiation. I mentioned last time that they do so in a way that depends on the fourth power of the temperature. And I'll show you a formula with that in just a minute. Get a teeny bit quantitative here. We also know the rate at which sunlight comes into the planet Earth. Um, and I'll tell you that rate. Above the atmosphere, if you put a satellite up there, and we've certainly done this with many satellites, um, you would measure on every square meter of Earth's surface about 1,400 watts falling from sunlight on every square meter, not of Earth's surface down here, but above the atmosphere. By the time that radiation gets through the atmosphere, by the way, in bright noonday sun, a square meter gets about 1,000 watts, about a kilowatt, about as much energy as it takes to run, say, a hairdryer. With my 20% efficient solar panel I showed you in several lectures, um, that would give you out about 200 watts, for example. But the entire planet is not always exposed to sunlight, and it's not always exposed to sunlight of such intensity, especially at the poles where the sunlight is hitting rel relatively obliquely. And if you average over night and day and all that, the rate at which sunlight hits an average square meter of Earth's surface is just about 240 watts. That's a good number to remember. Remember when we had Jamie up here turning the crank on the generator? She was barely able to produce 100 watts. So every square meter, even averaging for night and day, and the fact that some areas get less sunlight than others, uh, all comes out to an average of about 240 watts on every square meter, enough to run a very bright light bulb, for example. Now, so we know that 240 watts per square meter. So now we have the Earth in this state of energy balance. In comes the sunlight. Out goes the infrared. I've described the sunlight in yellow because it's visible. I've drawn the infrared in red to remind you that it's a different wavelength. And let's do the calculation. 
We know the rate at which sunlight's coming in is about 240 watts on every square meter, watts per square meter. Um, we know that the infrared radiation going out is given by a law, which I described sort of last time. I said it depends on the fourth power of the temperature. And actually, there's some universal constant of nature, and it's given by this Greek symbol sigma sitting here. So it says infrared out, sigma t to the fourth. We know the value of that constant sigma. It's just determined by experiments we can do in the laboratory. And so if the Earth is to be an energy balance, that infrared out, sigma t to the fourth, and notice it depends on how hot it is. The hotter it goes, the bigger t is, and therefore really the bigger t to the fourth is, then we get more infrared out. That sigma t to the fourth has to be equal to 240 watts per square meter. If it is, we're in energy balance. The Earth is losing as much energy as it's gaining from the sun. If that was not in balance, it would quickly come into balance because if the temperature were too low, more energy would be coming in, the planet would heat up. If the temperature were too high, more energy would be going out and the planet would cool down. So eventually the planet will reach equilibrium. At what temperature? At the temperature determined by that 240 watts per square meter being equal to sigma t to the fourth. When students take my climate change course at Middlebury College, one of the first things they do is that calculation. And they get an answer which doesn't seem too bad. The answer comes out 255 kelvins. That's about minus 18 degrees Celsius or about zero degrees Fahrenheit. Now, where I live in Vermont, zero degrees Fahrenheit is not unusual. 20 below zero Fahrenheit is unusual. But if I had to say, is the average temperature in northern Vermont, year-round average, uh, zero Fahrenheit, that sounds a little low to me. And most people, in the United States at least, live in warmer areas. So those numbers sound a little bit low. Certainly in the right ballpark, but it doesn't seem quite right. So something else must be going on here. And that's the key to understanding the more subtle details of Earth's climate. This picture I have here in this calculation give you the really gross overall details, or the gross overall picture. But it's not quite right. It gives an Earth whose average temperature is a bit on the cool side. So what else is going on? What else is affecting Earth's energy balance? And the answer is that what's affecting Earth's energy balance is the atmosphere. And the reason the atmosphere can affect the Earth's energy balance has to do with the fact, as shown in the picture I've been working from, that the incoming sunlight is visible light, short wavelength radiation, and the outgoing infrared is long wave radiation, and those two things interact differently with the gases in the atmosphere. In particular, the atmosphere is roughly transparent to visible light. That's why we can see the sun, that's why we can see the stars, that's why we can even see distant galaxies with our telescopes, because Earth's atmosphere is not entirely, but essentially transparent to visible light. On the other hand, it's substantially opaque to outgoing radiation, outgoing infrared. And the reason is not because of the dominant gases in the atmosphere, oxygen and nitrogen, but because of some more complicated molecules with three atoms, most of them, and particularly water vapor, H2O, our good old friend water, evaporated in the atmosphere, and carbon dioxide are the two gases that have the biggest effect in trapping outgoing infrared radiation and keeping it from going out. The atmosphere is not entirely opaque, but largely opaque to outgoing infrared radiation because of those gases. Uh, those gases are called greenhouse gases. The term is a slight misnomer. Uh, the idea is, well, they sort of act like the glass on the greenhouse that keeps the heat from escaping the greenhouse. Um, the reason that's kind of a misnomer is because the main thing the greenhouse ga glass does is to prevent air from convecting out of the greenhouse and carrying energy away like that. It has a slight effect in blocking outgoing infrared, but that's not its dominant effect. Its dominant effect is to stop convection. Whereas Earth's atmosphere, the dominant effect, the great, greatly significant effect, is to block outgoing infrared radiation. So the term greenhouse gas is a bit of a misnomer, and the whole greenhouse effect, a bit of a misnomer. But we're going to stick with it because that's what we tend to use. So what happens? So here's what we call the greenhouse effect. Here's the picture of Earth's energy balance, but now here's Earth with an atmosphere. I've drawn the atmosphere kind of exaggeratedly thick. Um, and what happens is the infrared, the, the greenhouse gases act as kind of a blanket, like an insulator. They make it hard for heat to escape. It's a little more subtle than that. They actually absorb the infrared, they heat up, and they re-radiate it like any hot object does, but they radiate in both directions. Some of it goes out to space, some of it comes back down to the surface. And as a result, the Earth's surface heats up, and it has to be at a hotter temperature than it would have had to be without the atmosphere in order to keep radiating back to space that same 240 watts per square meter, which it has to do to get itself into energy balance. And as a result, before we humans industrialized, the natural greenhouse effect a few hundred years ago resulted in the Earth's 
average temperature being warmer by about 60 degrees Fahrenheit, 33 degrees Celsius, than it would have been otherwise. That's why that zero degrees Fahrenheit was kind of low. We're actually 60 degrees warmer than that. The average temperature of the Earth is about 60 degrees Fahrenheit or 15 degrees Celsius. And that's called the natural greenhouse effect. And it's a wonderful thing. The Earth would be habitable, but very uncomfortable if it weren't for the natural greenhouse effect. And again, that natural greenhouse effect is caused primarily by water vapor in the atmosphere and to a significant but lesser extent by carbon dioxide. Now, before I go on, let me just give you some hint that we know this is correct. This is not just some cockamamie theory that someone's come up with without testing it. This is a theory we, we know to be correct and we can test it. Unfortunately, we can't test it by trying to modify Earth's atmosphere and seeing if it's right. Well, we're doing that but kind of inadvertently. We have a kind of uncontrolled experiment going on, which I'll get to more in a minute. Um, but we do have two other planets nearby for which we can also calculate what the temperature ought to be and compare with what the temperature actually is and with what the constituents of the atmosphere are. And so we really have uh, what I like to call a tail of three planets. And in this picture, this table, I list our neighbor planets, Venus, Earth, and Mars. Now, they're different distances from the sun, and so we would expect them to be at somewhat different temperatures, although that effect isn't all that dramatic. Venus, for example, ought to be at 50 degrees. If you do that simple calculation, sunlight in equals infrared out, 50 degrees Celsius. That is, that's hot, but it's not boiling. Earth, as we found, ought to be at minus 18 Celsius, and Mars ought to be at minus 60 because it's a little further from the sun. Significant variation, but not dramatic. Um, what are the actual temperatures? Well, Mars is only a hair warmer than projected. Why? Because Mars' atmosphere, although it's got a lot of carbon dioxide, is only about uh, one one-hundredth the density of Earth. So there's essentially no greenhouse effect. Earth is, as we know, 33 degrees Celsius warmer, 60 degrees Fahrenheit warmer, because of a fairly significant greenhouse effect. Venus has an atmosphere 100 times denser than Earth, 95% carbon dioxide, and long ago it had a runaway greenhouse effect, which brought it up to this cooking temperature of 500 Celsius, about 900 Fahrenheit. Venus has had a runaway greenhouse effect, and its surface is entirely baked because of that. So this is a kind of experiment that nature has provided us, convincing us that this whole theory of the greenhouse effect is, in fact, correct and describes planetary uh, atmospheres and planetary climates. And now the question is, what are we human beings doing to Earth's climate? In particular, what are we doing to Earth's atmosphere? And the main thing we've been doing for about 200, 300 years is burning fuels, fossil fuels that represent trapped sunlight that was buried in the Earth long ago, burning those fossil fuels and releasing the products of combustion into the atmosphere. And we've actually altered the atmosphere in significant ways. Here's a graph of carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere from roughly 1750 or so to about the year 2000, actually a little bit beyond 2000. This graph goes up to 2005. Um, and what has been going on here? Well, the atmospheric concentration of carbon dioxide has been increasing, and it's been increasing fairly dramatically and fairly rapidly in recent decades. Um, it started out at about 270 parts per million. That's a unit that says, okay, if I took a million one-gallon milk jugs and filled them with, with air and separated them into their components, 270 of those milk jugs, not that many of that million milk jugs, would contain pure carbon dioxide. But that number has risen by about 30 percent until in the middle years of the first decade of the 21st century, it's around 380 parts per million and rising. How do we know that? Well, these data come from a variety of sources, but in recent years they come from a very careful monitoring station on Mauna Loa in Hawaii, as well as from other places. And I show in an inset graph here the Mauna Loa data from about 1960, and you see it fluctuating up and down, and that's actually due to the fact that in the northern hemisphere, when summer comes, plants come out and they uh, absorb carbon dioxide, and the carbon dioxide level goes down. And then when they lose their leaves, the carbon dioxide level goes up again. And you might say, what, doesn't that happen in the southern hemisphere? Well, it doesn't because the northern hemisphere has most of the land mass. And we're seeing that asymmetry. And I show you that to give you a sense that we know very accurately what this carbon dioxide has been doing. We also know that this carbon dioxide is from ancient sources because we can date it by the amount of radioactive material left in it, which is almost none. And if it were new carbon that were coming out of the atmosphere or the surface of the ocean or something, it would be still more radioactive. More on this in Lecture 34. Uh, it wouldn't be dangerously radioactive, but it would have a little radiation that we detect to date things. So we know that we have changed the carbon dioxide concentration of the atmosphere in recent years substantially. 
Now, to understand a little more what effect this might have on climate, we need to look at what climate has been doing over time. So here's a picture of uh, what we think the temperature of the Earth has been like over the last 160,000 years. This comes from uh, data extracted from deep ice cores drilled into Greenland and Antarctica. We extract little bubbles of trapped air from there, and we can measure directly the carbon dioxide content. And by studying the different kinds of oxygen are in, that are in there, we can actually get a rough measure of temperature. And you see a pattern in this picture, and it's a pattern that goes back at least 500,000 years because we have ice cores that far back. This particular graph goes from zero, the present on the right, to 160,000 years ago on the left. But the same kind of general pattern repeats itself at least 500,000 years, and we have good reason to think for roughly um, something like um, uh, 20 million years. And what's the pattern? Well, the pattern is there are these peaks of relative warmth. Um, the present is one of these periods. They're called interglacial warm periods. They last about 10,000 years, and you can see one that occurred in this picture maybe 120, 130,000 years ago, and another one that's occurring now. And those are punctuated by much cooler periods, which we call ice ages or glacial periods, which are significantly but not dramatically much cooler. And one important thing to notice from this graph is that the difference, the average temperature difference between the warm period we're in now and an ice age is on the order of 6 degrees Celsius. That's something on the order of maybe 11 degrees Fahrenheit, 10 or 11 degrees Fahrenheit. It's not a huge difference. Remember that when someone says, oh, Earth is going to warm up 5 or 6 degrees, what does that possibly matter? Well, the difference between now and an ice age, when there were 2 miles of ice on top of much of North America, uh, down to about Long Island, which is the terminal moraine of the glaciers that they left after they receded, um, that, that difference is a matter of maybe 10 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's what the temperature has been doing roughly over the last 160,000 years. It's been repeating this pattern before that. We think this pattern is triggered by subtle changes in the Earth's orbit. It's affected by other planets, by the tilt of the Earth's axis, and things like that. And then the natural mechanisms within the climate system cause the more rapid rise in temperature and then the slower fall. Um, what happens to the carbon dioxide? Well, the carbon dioxide tracks almost identically. And again, this is carbon dioxide measured from these bubbles in these trapped gases and in, in, in ice cores. Um, you might say, well, uh, it's clearly there's cause and effect here, but what's the cause and what's the effect? It's not that simple, and we don't fully understand this connection completely, but what we think happens is something like this. It warms up a little bit. Well, when it warms up, the ocean can't dissolve as much carbon dioxide, so some carbon dioxide comes out of the ocean. Various other things like that occur that cause it to warm up still more because of this greenhouse effect. And we think a, a sequence of these feedback effects, which we don't fully understand, causes a very small change in temperature to be amplified into this rapid rise of about 10 degrees Fahrenheit, about 6 degrees Celsius, that brings us into the interglacial warm period. And then, as the subtle changes occur again in the astronomical parameters, that gradually, feedback again, gradually takes that down. And we don't understand all the details, and we're carefully studying now a lot of these rapid fluctuations you see in this graph. Um, but now I want you to remember a number that I showed you when I showed the, you the industrial era CO2. Remember the concentration started out at about 270 or 280 parts per million. And you see that on the right-hand edge of the carbon dioxide graph, the blue graph, where I put the scale there in parts per million. What was the number today? And where would it be on this graph? Think about that a minute. Okay? That number, in case you didn't remember, was about 380 parts per million. Where would that be on this graph? Up there. The top of that arrow is today's carbon dioxide concentration in Earth's atmosphere. And that change, which brings us into a regime that our planet has not seen for at least the past 500,000 years, and probably not for at least the past 20 million years, gives us a higher level of carbon dioxide than the planet has experienced in that kind of time. And we human beings are known to be the cause of that change. And that's not something about which there is any controversy at all. So I want to emphasize that we have already done to the atmosphere something quite dramatic. We've changed its carbon dioxide level by a huge amount, by at least as much as the difference in carbon dioxide level between now and when we were in an ice age, but in the opposite direction. That's a big effect on the atmosphere. That's us human beings affecting the atmosphere globally. And as the developing world develops, particularly China with its over one billion people in the coming decades, um, that is only going to go up. China has enormous coal reserves. It's its quickest way to industrialize and get energy. And we're going to see a lot more carbon dioxide going into the atmosphere. 
So what's going to happen? What's this doing to our planet's climate? Well, we have good enough temperature records that we can look at the actual temperature of the planet, average global temperature, with pretty good confidence over roughly the last 150 years, since about 1850 or so. And here's a graph of one of the several data sets. They look almost identical in which people have carefully interpreted this data, worked on a number of effects that might give you incorrect readings, compensated for them, and so on. And what you see is, at the start of this period, a fairly constant temperature, um, a, sl a significant rise in the early part of the 20th century, a uh, level period or even decline in the middle years of the 20th century, which may ironically be due to the rapid industrialization after World War II, uh, in which a lot of uh, pollution was put into the atmosphere that actually resulted in a cooling, and then a very rapid rise in the final three decades, particularly of the 20th century, that rise continuing into the 21st century. This data goes through the year 2003. Um, and it includes the warmest year on record until that time, which was the year 1998. Um, the, the years 2003 and 2002 were very warm also, right up there among the top years. So there has been a dramatic rise in Earth's temperature in the past few decades. Question is, is this something that might be occurring naturally, or is that related to this dumping of large amounts of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere? Well, we'd like to answer that question, but we can't really push this record back further with thermometers because we don't have accurate temperature records going back further than that. But we can reconstruct that temperature. And here's a reconstruction that was done by climatologists who took into account, in this case, 112 different proxy indicators for temperature. Uh, the state of coral reefs, tree rings, cosmic ray data, um, the ratio of different oxygen isotopes, the kinds of organisms that were found in sediments, all kinds of things, 112 different indicators to try to reconstruct what we think the global temperature, did. actually this is the northern hemisphere temperature, but the global temperature is probably very similar, over the last thousand years. And recently, by the way, this particular uh, study has been pushed back almost 2,000 years. And the general trend, the, 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 the blue there are the reconstructed temperatures, the the very faint blue is the error limits. We, we are 95% confident the actual temperature lay within those values and, and reasonably confident it follows something like that blue and black graph you see there in the middle. And if you had to sum that up, you would say the first 900 years of the millennium from the year 1000 to the year 2000 was characterized by a gradual decline in temperature with a few fluctuations. The last 100 years, that is the 20th century and this doesn't go quite into the 21st, but if it did, that trend would continue, is characterized by a very rapid rise. And that's the red data. The red data is the actual data I just showed you from, from, from thermometers. And the red and the blue overlap a little bit because the reconstruction was carried forward, and it indeed agrees with the record from thermometers. So it looks like something dramatic has happened in the last century, something which is dramatic on time scales uh, of at least 1,000 years. Now, that doesn't mean there might not be natural fluctuations on that level but that such a natural fluctuation would coincide with the time in which we have done something so dramatic to the atmosphere is most unusual. And that's part of what leads climate scientists to state with considerable confidence that much of the warming of the last 50 years, this is an internationally agreed upon statement, much of the warming that we've experienced in the past 50 years is related to human activities and particularly to the burning of fossil fuels. What do we think is going to happen in the future? Well, the future is harder to predict. We have considerable confidence in our computer climate models that allow us to, uh, we've actually done models where we started a thousand with conditions a thousand years ago and projected to the present, and it works very well. And if we put in the human-induced carbon, the human-caused carbon dioxide, it shows that substantial upward rise. But predicting the future is a little bit iffier, in part because the future depends on what human beings do. If we enacted substantial uh, laws to control the emission of carbon dioxide, for example, that will affect what the temperature is going to be 100 years from now. But as best we can tell from computer models, there's a range of temperature rises we can expect in the current century before the year 2100. And that range is from roughly 1.5 degrees Celsius to about 6 degrees Celsius. That's very crudely maybe 3 to 9 degrees Fahrenheit. And in that context... If I take this graph of a 1,000 years of temperature reconstruction and real temperature data, I have to shrink it down considerably to add to it what we think will happen in the next 100 years. I have to change those scales. I'm going to use the middle range projection from the Internet Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change up to the year 2100, and that's what we can expect might happen. 
Uh, if the middle range projections, not the extreme ones, not the minimum ones, but the middle range turn out to be true, we're going to see a temperature rise in both rapidity and um, amount that is unprecedented, certainly over a couple thousand years and probably much longer in the history of our planet. I'm not going to talk about the consequences, but there will be consequences. And even if this isn't something that bothers you, it means this aspect of physics in your life is going to be something that's very significant in the lives of your children and your grandchildren.